education in the education you know experience that our students have at Seton Hall University. Of course, it's broadening their worldviews by visiting this in this case, you know, Italy. This course that I teach every every year. Also, it has opened the eyes for future career uh, possibilities. Uh, for those students actually that know Italian, for example, I have some of the students here that are going to talk to us, you know, about uh, uh, our experience uh, in Italy. They also have the, the, the possibility of um, uh, practicing their Italian, okay, the Italian that they have learned from their uh, grandparents, for example. Uh, also, the, this immersion in another culture, it really uh, is an eye opener for students. And also, I can see, you know, and witness that after our, our pilgrimage in Italy, I see that, that students change, students convert, but convert in, a, in an interior way. So there is a growth that happens during this, uh, these trips. And of course, we are a Catholic university, we are a diocesan university, kind of renewing the vows, let's say, with Rome is very important. So uh, this, this yearly visits to Rome is um, uh, also, you know, serves that, uh, that purpose. And I also have students, we are connected with, the, and, and when we go to Rome, we also visit the, the Pontifical North American College, where many of our priests where when they when they studied in Rome, they stayed in the in the Pontifical North American College. And now I have seminarians that I used to have students, you know, so there is this continuum of Seton Hall experience that happens in Rome. And also pilgrimages as this course is, although this is a, a, an, a, an academic course, uh, they always um, uh, we, we grow together, we support each other, we convert interiorly together, and also we forge friendships that are still continuing among uh, our students. So how I do this course, it is 20, 21 years actually that I'm teaching this course. It is, um, the, the, the study abroad actually, it's a part of an academic course. Okay, it's part of an academic course. We, we start the course when the semester starts with lectures and as every other academic course at, at Seton Hall, but we take the spring break and some days, some bonus days actually, more, more than the spring break, and we go to Rome. Now, the course is called Italy in the Footsteps of the Saints. And of course, you know, when you think of Seton Hall University, think about Mother Seton, for example. Our university has the name of Mother Seton. Mother Seton is the first American-born saint. And what happened to Mother Seton? Mother Seton went to, to Italy, and there, having this pilgrimage... Okay, she went for health issues, but there was also an interior pilgrimage that happened to Mother Seton. Mother Seton actually converted to Catholicism in Livorno. And I've sent students, Seton Hall students to Livorno just to revisit this, uh, this roots that, that we have in Italy of this interior conversion, following in the footsteps of, of Mother Seton. Now, I have prepared some slides just to showcase, you know, the, uh, the first class that I have with students. We, we dwell, and uh, Sandro, now you can share my slides if you, if you can. Sandro? It's opening up. Oh, it's opening up, okay. Okay, so this is the the, uh, the first lecture that I uh, that I give the students before before our uh, our trip to Italy. So you can go on the second slide. So who are the saints, and why do we still um, you know study the saint? What is the official uh, what is the official uh, process of declaring somebody a saint? Because in in Italy, you know, it's it's an overwhelming amount of saints that we, that we discuss. So it is, uh, and I explore the, 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 the canonization. Uh, what does this mean? Canonization, the person is worthy of inclusion in the canon of, uh, in the, canon of the mass, right? So prior to uh, 1234, so uh, prior than the 13th century, the church did not have a process of canonization as it is now. Usually martyrs, and those uh, recognized as such were declared saints 
by the church at the time of their deaths. Before the legalization of Christianity in the year 313 AD by Emperor Constantine the Great, the tombs of the martyrs, like for example, St. Peter that we visit when we are in, uh, uh, in Italy, were marked and kept as places of homage and also veneration. The anniversaries, of, uh, the anniversaries of their deaths were remembered and placed on the local church calendar. But after the legalization of Christianity, oftentimes basilicas or shrines were built at the place where the saint was martyred, as is the case, for example, with, uh, with St. Peter. As time went on, the church saw the need to tighten the canonization process. Sixtus, Sixtus the, the fifth, Pope Sixtus the fifth, entrusted the congregation for the causes of saints to oversee the entire process of making saints. Okay, and how, how, what is the, the what is this process? First, it is beatification, not beautification, because sometimes my students may mess this up. So beatification, somebody is beatified, and then the person is canonized. Where is the difference between these two? Beatification is mostly that the saint or the person is venerated locally, while canonization is when the person is, uh, you know, venerated in the entire Catholic Church. You can go to the second slide now. And here I explained the, what is the process. Um, so first, of course, the, the fame and the sanctity of the person, then the, the, the formation of this tribunal in the Vatican, which examines every piece of evidence that has to do with, uh, with the person under investigation. People who, there are people in that committee that, uh, that investigate even, even all the reasons why a person should not be uh, be made the same. One element is whether any special favor or miracle, so the miracle now enters the, the, the investigation, has been granted through the candidate's in, uh, intervention. And of course, if the person has, uh, has published works, uh, like for example, St. Catherine of Siena, or Mother Teresa for that matter, of course, uh, people look even at, uh, uh, at, their, uh, at, their, at their writings, how pure is the doctrine? Are they faithful to the magisterium, uh, to the magisterium of the church, and so on and so forth? Then a person which is who is called postulator, postulator, postulator in Latin, presents and discusses the cause of uh, in the congregation for the uh, for the causes of saints. And if the candidate was a martyr. That's another uh, uh, case. The congregation determines wh whether the person died for his faith in Christ or not. In other cases, the congregation investigate if the candidate was motivated by a profound charity towards his neighbors and practice virtues in an extraordinary manner. Then the postulator, so you see the, all the terminology that I have there, uh, the postulator uh, prepares the positio, that is the case, which is presented to nine theologians and six positive votes sends the cause to a larger meeting of the congregation of the bishops and cardinals. A two-thirds positive vote then sends the cause to the Holy Father, who is the final uh, judge, let's say, in, the, in, in, the, in, uh, in proclaiming, uh, proclaiming somebody a saint. We can go to the next slide. Um, and now it is the communion of saints. What is the communion of saints? How are we in contact with the, uh, with the saints? Are these saints that are canonized part of the church? Of course, you know, there I explain to students the three layers of the church. Of course, the pilgrim church on earth, the triumphant church in heaven and the church in purgatory. And these layers of the church, saints of course are part of the triumphant uh, uh, church, are in, in, are in constant communication via, of course, prayer. And that's why in all these shrines that we go, in all this pilgrimage that we go in Rome, 
uh, students see, witness, step, and pray with the saints, okay? And through the saints. So there is this dynamic unity happening between these three layers of, uh, of the church. So uh, the next slide, please, Sandro. Uh, and then students, of course, have a lot of questions about, uh, and especially those students that do not come from a Catholic uh, uh, background, Catholic faith, but they are Protestants, for example, or students that have no faith at all or have no knowledge about uh, Catholicism. How does the worship of God differs from the worship of saints and angels in, uh, in Catholicism? And I explain, you know, uh, uh, worship of God is adoration, that of angels and saints is veneration and honor. And it is through the saints that we pray to God, okay? And uh, uh, with the exception of Mary, because Mary is venerated, is honored above all saints and angels, because she is, of course, the mother of God. And it is the Council of Trent in 1563 that sanctioned this in um, uh, this uh, veneration of Mary. And also uh, we explore the, the active role of saints in, in the church and how this comes very alive in the liturgy, liturgy of the church. For example, baptism, Eucharist, communion, also people that are named after saints, um, uh, are protected by the saints and so on and so forth. So uh, another, uh, we can go to the next slide, is the relics. Because when we go to Italy and visit uh, uh, and follow in the footsteps of the saints, we also see many relics. What are the relics? This is something that is very typical Catholic, right? In the Protestant churches or in Islam, for example, it's not this tradition. What are relics? Uh, first class uh, relics and um, uh, second class uh, relics. Of course, first class relics are the physical body parts, clothing, instruments connected with the martyrs or a saint, uh, uh, saint's life. Or in the case of a martyr, uh, is imprisonment, for example, or torture, uh, this, uh, th these tools that were used for, for his torture or her torture. Second class relics, representative relics, are those the faithful have touched to the physical body parts or grave of the saints. And this second relic thing happens a lot in my, in my trips, actually, and I'm sure that the students will bring that. Uh, so, and then the questions that I get from students is, is the veneration of relics lawful in Catholicism according to canon law? Yes, it is. And even in the Council of Trent, it actually, it specifically said that through relics, many benefits are granted to man by God. So uh, this is like uh, an introductory uh, a lecture that I uh, that I uh, that I give to students before uh, before we dwell into more material that has to do directly with the life of the saint, for example, or the writing of the saint, for example, the writing of St. Francis of Assisi, Padre Pio, and other saints that we, or, or, or the scripture, uh, uh, of course, you know, letters of Peter, Paul, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, I am three minutes above my time. Now I will give the floor to my wonderful students that now actually they have graduated Seton Hall. But this course, Italy in the Footsteps of the Saints, have, has very much stayed with them. And it's not only the course actually, but also the friendship that these people has, have forged through this pilgrimage in Rome that has stayed with them. Now students, I'm going um, uh, to go on um, uh, alphabetically. If you can just say a few words about yourself, so where you are now, and all the students actually are Catholic studies, either minors or majors in Catholic studies, okay? So where you are now and how this course, Italy in the Footsteps of the Saints, or the other course that I teach in Italy, impacted your life. I'll give the, fo the floor to Nicolas Cozzarelli one of my uh, students who graduated actually last year, right, Nick? Yes, I graduated in uh, 2019. 
Um, so at Seton Hall, I was a biology major, but I also was a minor in Catholic studies and Italian. And uh, currently I'm a second year medical student at Hackensack Meridian School of Medicine. But um, the the whole Italy in the footsteps of, uh, in the Saint footsteps in the I can't even speak. Uh, but <laughs> the, the course to Italy, uh, it was a really great experience. Uh, before we had the opportunity to determine if we want to go, I was determining if I want to go because I'm very familiar with Italy. I've gone eight times previously, and I was very happy that I went because th the amount of stuff that we do uh, in the time that we are there exceeds anything. I know Dr. Murzaku, uh and Roberto, who we travel with our tour guide there, they spend a lot of time uh, picking all the different sites. So when you're there, it, it leaves lasting memories. You're walking through your textbook. You visit all these great places that Dr. Murzaku has spoken about, and you, you could remember it in your mind forever, but even just the the small lessons that you learn as well. Uh, I remember one of the first places we went to was Lanciano, and there was a Eucharistic miracle that occurred there. And that was one of the things that stuck with me the most. Uh, and there was, it was the body and blood of Christ transformed into actual human tissue, and they did studies on it. And they found that that tissue was uh, heart tissue, and the blood type was, uh, it was, uh, AB negative, which is a, the universal acceptor. Uh, it could accept all different types of blood. So that one small thing really stuck with me because Christ, uh, God is the universal acceptor of all of us. So I, I was so happy to uh, to attend the, the trip and I would definitely do it again if I could. You can, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit, busy, a, bit, a bit busy now, in a few years maybe. Puoi praticare anche il tuo italiano, because Nick actually, his background is, uh, I mean, his roots are, are Italian. You can tell from his last name. And Nick, when, when he was in Italy, he was very fluent in Italian. So that is uh, also another benefit besides, you know, studying the history of Christianity. Thank you very much, uh, Nick. And we are really very proud of you, you know. Um, Okay, now I will invite John Hughes. John? Hey, Dr. M. Yeah, hi, hi folks. Oh, like, there we go. Hi, folks. My name is John Hughes. Uh, I'm a teacher of world religions and global Christianity at Oratory Prep and Summit. And a little bit about the course is that I get to teach it every year in a way, in the sense that the photos from, the from Italy in the Footsteps of the Saints are photos that I show my kids every year you know, inside St. Peter's Basilica, the Roman tracks at Grotta Ferrata, uh, the inside of the of the Church of the Jesu in Rome, which is a church with, that has a pretty sign great significance for me because I'm very into the Ignatian spirituality. Um, so in that extent, the course very much lives on. While I was at Seton Hall, I was actually a triple major in secondary special ed uh, history and then Catholic studies, and Dr. M was so flexible in getting different courses uh, to make to help account for Catholic studies. I think the biggest thing about that course that lives on with me is number one, the photos, but two is it's such a concrete way of getting to the heart of the faith in the sense that you see, again, you, we visited the tomb of Peter. That was the moment for me that stood out. You know, I still get chills thinking about it. And just being able to experience, she mentioned the knack you know, I had any number of people I knew even at that time that were studying at the North American College and having the uh, opportunity to interact with them and even having dinner with my cousin and then a Seton Hall priest, Father Joe Chapel, uh, when we were in Rome. And just what are the odds of having three people that you'd see from, you know, a summer gathering all together, sitting down for a meal in Rome? And those kind of experiences are just unforgettable. And when you have a professor who knows the city as well as Dr. Murzaku does, you're getting the goods. So it was it was an incredible experience. And for anybody considering going on it, Dr. Murzaku puts any other tour guide to shame. So just do it. Kind John, and I'm very happy, you know, that you use this experience in your uh, in your teaching, you know, so the impact is continuing, I guess, of our course. And one thing, because uh, John mentioned Grotta Ferrata, Grotta Ferrata is so out of the, how can I say, out of the tourist books, 
okay, or Lanciano that Nick uh, that Nick mentioned. So all my trips, actually, all my study abroad is uh, is around a theme, right? And it's not the trips that usually are, but uh, are are led, you know, or uh, or. Um, uh, put together by this uh, commercial or educational companies, but these are all tailored towards a theme. For example, the trip that, that we went in 2019 uh, was uh, Pope Francis came up with, uh, with an encyclical when he spoke about the theology of the peripheries. So we went from the periphery of Sicily to Rome. So we were ascending in our pilgrimage. So we went to these saints that were not very, very known, right? They were not very known to St. Peter. So that was our trajectory. Uh, now I will invite another, another student, who ha um, Jean MacArthur. Uh, Jean was, um, um, was a Catholic studies major, actually, and now she is uh, uh, she is uh, studying theology at the School of Theology. Jean, please. Hello, everyone. I'm really happy that Dr. Mazzocco asked me to speak. Um, I went on three of the trips. Uh, they were Catholic studies classes. Um, I graduated with a Catholic studies degree in uh, December last year. And now I am pursuing my master's in theology, like I, Dr. Mazaku said. Um, the three trips were just spiritually outstanding. But the one that I really have to speak about the most is last year's trip when we were able to travel. We went to San Giovanni Rotondo, and that is the site of Padre Pio of Petrolcina. Um, he is my go-to saint. I have loved him for such a long time, and I never thought that I would ever get to see him. Um, he's a, he was a Capuchin priest, part of the Franciscan order. Um, he was a man that had many spiritual gifts. Um, he bilocated, he read men's souls, he had an, a fragrant odor that, that emanated from his wounds. He heard confessions for 16 hours a day. His masses lasted for two hours. He was said to speak to his guardian angel and to the souls in purgatory. But I think what he is best known for is the stigmata. Um, he received the stigmata when he um, became a priest in 1910. He died in 1968 and he was canonized by John Paul II in 2002. We were able to go to the friary, San Giovanni Rotundo, and pray before his uh, incorrupt body. Now, some of the saints' um, bodies are incorrupt. That means that they did not decompose at all. And he he looked like he was sleeping. And he is covered, in the, it's a glass covering that's around him. But we were able to go and pray, um, pray. And I had so many prayers I had to talk to him about, but that really was my highlight. The trips that Dr. Mazzocco puts together are five plus stars and above. We eat the best food, we sleep in the best places, and the things that we see with Dr. Mazzocco, I, I, I don't think any other tour guide could ever put that together. The saints that we have seen in the past were St. Francis, um, St. Augustine, Monica, and of course, St. Peter. His bones of St. Peter, which is in the scavi. So I just wanted to say thank you for letting me speak, but my dream came true when I was able to pray before Padre Pio. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jean. But I know you know that miracles happen uh, in Italy. And I'm just uh, thinking now of, um, uh, you know, even Mother Seton, you know, she converted to, to Catholicism in Italy. She had a wonderful Italian ex uh, experience in Livorno. And as I said, I went with my students, you know, and visited uh, Livorno. And also the friendship that the students, not only among themselves, but also with Italians, you know, it's a pleasure to be around Italians. And uh, Mother Seton, uh, Seton, Seton's daughter, actually, she said being so overwhelmed, you know, with, a, with the Italian hospitality, she, she said, quote, 
Oh, mama, how many friends God has provided for us in this strange land. For they are our friends before they know us. And that is really the spirit, you know, that, that, that students get from the, from the Italians. Because even the hotels that we stay in Italy are in the middle of the city. That is my approach to travel. So that students had that total immersion in the Italian culture. And the two people actually that, uh, that organized this tailored trip, thematic trip, for us, are they work in the North American College, in the Pontifical North American College. Uh, her name is Lori Mondaini and Roberto Mondaini. The, the students, you know, they all know them and love them very much. So um, we have this, uh, this connection uh, with them that uh, we want to do also to continue, you know, in the future. Now, uh, I'm going to invite Jose Morrojo. Even Jose is a Catholic studies double major, and he can say a few words, you know, about himself and also uh, uh, the trip. Yes, Jose, please. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's uh, really, I thank Dr. Merzaku for inviting me for this. And it's really uh, an experience that I would like to talk about as it really changed uh, my life and, you know, what I intend on doing. And um, I would just like to show, you know, a little bit of... Uh, slides a little bit of the pictures because I I like to tell my uh, my experiences from pictures because pictures are uh, I as people know um, I like taking pictures and I feel that they really tell us a story um, through that so um, this was like our experience you know joining in uh, uh, in our trip uh, as any with any study abroad and as Nick said uh, you know, our experience is different from the in-classroom experience because in in-classroom we learn about the theoretical, we learn about the topics, we learn about the things and the books, but the books come alive like the like in the little kids, you know, they get the pop-up books and we really go into the books and we live through the books uh, that we learn about in the classroom and we learn about, you know, the development of Western faith, the civilization, the history and everything that affects us to this day. Um, we also visited, as Jean said, the uh, St. Giovanni Rotondo. Um, and what caught me about this was the serving qualities um, and the, uh, the need to serve others, um, along with that Franciscan spirituality for caring for the poor and marginalized, um, for that sick and the vulnerable, as um, Dr. Mirzako said, you know, all, all of the people that are in the peripheries that are not accounted for. Um, caring for that sick in the hospital that we saw the, um, that was, uh, you know, Padre Pio's initiative, you know, um, I think that was pretty much what, uh, what really caught me and um, that mission, that Catholic mission of, you know, building those leaders who would care for others. I think that's part of, you know, Seton Hall's mission of building servant leaders for, um, for tomorrow. The objects that we see um, and everything, you know, that we learn about in the textbook, in the classroom and through the study abroad, I think those are really things that we wouldn't be able to grasp if we weren't physically there. As again, we see the first class relics, we get the front row seats to see these amazing people, the great leaders who um, we learn through their example how to live our own life. And pretty much just defending our faith, you know, immersing, um, immersing ourselves in, into Italy with that culture, with learning that language and, you know, dying, uh, seeing people dying for their faith. And it just gives us motivation to live our own lives uh, following Christ, um, if you are a believer or, you know, just attaining all those beautiful, that wonderful knowledge uh, about that Italy has to offer. And I would invite everyone, you know, to just experience Italy with the friends that we make throughout that experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jose. And Jose actually is uh, uh, was a double major physics and Catholic studies. Yep. And now, Jose, you are at NJIT, right? Yes, I'm at NJIT. I'm studying computer engineering now. Again, Excellent. trying to combine both my faith and um, what I learned through Catholic uh, through, through Catholic studies and my engineering degree. Excellent, excellent. You make us very, very proud, Jose. And one thing, actually, because we saw even the Padre Pio's hospital, and there were a few students, actually, that were uh, pre-meds or in the biology 
uh, that I had with me, and uh, they were fascinated by the by Padre Pio's approach to, uh, to, to healthcare, actually. This holistic approach, seeing the person as body and soul, and not only, you know, the body as a machine, in other words, that to repair the parts of the machine. But there is much more to the body. Uh, it is this uh, holistic uh, way of doing, you know, medicine. So we visited even, uh, even, that, uh, uh, even that when we were in, uh, visiting Padre Pio. Um, and uh, one 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 thing that I want to share with you is that in this trip, actually, it was the first time in 21 years that I am doing the, the study abroad that I had, that we had actually a totally blind student with us. Uh, she... <laughs> She had a tremendous time. She made it actually even on the top of uh, St. Peter's, um, uh, you know, dome. So, uh, um, but it was a, a really a very, how can I say, touching experience that a, that a, uh, that a totally blind person can experience through other senses Italy, okay? So... Um, now I will invite another student from that group, and her name is Erica Newman. Uh, Erica, please. Hi, everyone. Hi, it's so good to see everyone and be back with this group. Um, I miss you guys a lot. Um, so I am back home in Connecticut, actually. I am working at another Catholic institution here, uh, the University of St. Joseph in West Hartford. And I am serving as the annual giving coordinator for our advancement team. Um, I did four years of undergrad at Seton Hall, um, not in Catholic studies, and then stuck around to get my master's in public relations. But I was fortunate enough to work as a graduate assistant in the Center for Catholic Studies. So I got to work right with Inez and with Gloria. And for all of you who know Monsignor Liddy, I get, got to work with him as well. And he's just a wonderful man. So I was fortunate enough to go on this trip during my time um, with Catholic studies and be roommates with Jean, which is just like the best part of the trip. It was so much fun. It was the most amazing experience I ever had because I wasn't able to do any kind of study abroad time um, during my undergraduate time because I was part of the swim team and never was able to do that kind of travel. So this opportunity for me was I think I burst into tears when I finally decided that I was going to go on the trip because I was just so happy. And there were so many things that I loved about this trip that I had to create an entire scrapbook of it just to keep it all in one spot. But I think one of the most spectacular things for me was um, during one of our last days on the trip, we got to gather in the Vatican um, where the Pope was going to be there addressing all of his all of his people. And if I can describe this, give it any justice, it's kind of like being at a concert where your like favorite celebrity is, except in this whole like awe sensing way that everyone just feels calm and peaceful and so overwhelmed with emotion that you're standing in front of this most beautiful, loving person. Um, and he even did a blessing over our group um, even though the whole thing was in Italian too, so like only like Nick and some people could understand it, it was still so moving that it brought me to tears just to be in that moment with the Pope and be one with my faith. Um, I think overall the experience teaches us so much about so many other people. We learned about hundreds of saints while we're there, but if you really allow the trip to show you more about your life, it, it can give you really great insight about how to live and what you want to follow your morals and values because these saints that we learned about never followed what everyone else told them to do they they walked to the beat of their own drum and were able to create such impactful change for their followers because of that so if you allow this trip to really touch you in the way that it should you can really like have a whole new outlook on life and it's just really a beautiful experience so thank you guys for having me. I love the trip and everybody should go on this because it's really life changing. Thank you so much, Erica. I, I got a little text, you know, from Connor. Uh, Connor, are you there? If you want to say a few words about uh, uh, Connor Farrell, uh, yeah. about the trip, you are more than welcome to, please. I'll yeah, I'll keep it short and sweet. Hey. Uh, hey Good to see uh, you. I, 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 I was, miss uh, you guys. 
<laughs> yeah, miss you as well. It's just you know I had to I had to say something. It was it was too great seeing everybody on the screen and not have to say anything. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm Connor. I was I graduated last year. I went on the trip uh, 20 let's see 2018 2019. It was 2019, um, and it was a life changing experience. I mean, I initially went in uh, as as somebody who's just going on a study abroad trip. I wasn't a Catholic studies major or minor. Um, but it turned into something so much more than that so quickly. Uh, the group of people that we went with, uh, the things that we saw, the things that we experienced were were so so odd, odd, just inspiring and amazing. Um, you learn you learned so much, and the experiences that we had there were truly life changing. So I'd I'd give anything to go back and do it again. Honestly, still keep in contact with most of the people from our group too, which is just awesome. You leave with you know another whole group of friends, which is just awesome. So anyways, I'll keep it short. I wasn't expected to talk. So <laughs> nice <laughs> thank you everybody. so much actually also for joining this. And that, that is something, you know, that Italy keeps us together, you know, those friendships that we that we forge there. And I see actually even uh, our provost, Dr. Katia Passerini, that has joined us. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Passerini. I know that you are uh, uh, very busy, and we are really very grateful for your time. If you want, would like to say a few a few things uh, to the students, I would, I would love that. And you are Italian! <laughs> que bello! <laughs> for, for the event. No, but I, I was delighted. I was especially delighted when you said it's wonderful to be among Italians or with Italians. So that's what Elizabeth uh, Siron um, said. So that, that was very touching. No, but thank you. Thank you. It's been a learning experience for me. Um, and of course, a lot of the places that you mentioned, I know them personally. I, I was born and raised in Rome uh, until, and stayed there until I was 23. I have to say, though, uh, when you are raised in a city, you always leave it as a, uh, never as a tourist. So you probably know more uh, of many nice places than uh, than I do because I, I had to leave the city in many, many different ways. But um, it's wonderful and it's a pleasure to just travel back with, with your stories. So I'm delighted to have joined the conversation. Thank you very much, Dr. Pastorini. So, um, Sandro, do you want to open now for discussion? Even the students are, are, are here and um, uh, they can answer any questions if we have students yes. among the audience or parents. And of course, you know, uh, parents out there, I'm also a parent. So I'm just holding, you know, three caps on my on my head. Uh, my, my son, John Murzaku, he's, uh, he's a senior. Uh, he was supposed to go on the trip last year, but he didn't unfortunately, because of, of COVID. Uh, then I had my, my daughter, Era Katerina, actually, that uh, she graduated Seton Hall in 2010. Now she's a medical doctor. And uh, she went to the trip with Monsignor Lydia and myself. Uh, now I have another one at home, actually, that he's getting ready to, uh, to be my third, you know, at Seton Hall University. So please um, ask any questions or comments, you know, that you might have. Yes, if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand or you can share it in the chat or just unmute yourself and ask Inez or any of the students any questions if you like. Uh, th this is uh, Robert Boodleman and uh, I, I feel and, and it was good education for me, even though I known about what you're doing for quite some period of time. Uh, Catholic studies is the essence of what Seton Hall University is. And I think that what I've heard here uh, demonstrates that quite clearly. Uh, I can see how the double major or the double minor or double program is very helpful to the students. And I can see how uh, these things uh, increase their faith. And which is one of the things that uh, in talking with uh, first Archbishop Myers and now with uh, uh, with Cardinal Talmud and with our current president is how do we measure uh, what we have done with our students in the four years they've been there. And the key has always been have their faith increased, have their relationship to God increased. And uh, I think the program that you have here 
uh, demonstrates that those that participate have that experience. So um, I, I'm very pleased to have listened again to the program and what you're doing, doctor. So thank you again very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Buldeman. Yes, indeed, actually, because this uh, these students uh, study uh, the history of Christianity, the theology, from an academic perspective, but also have the experience of going on the site, on situ, we say uh, uh, in Latin. So, and it's a, it's a different kind of experience, you know, that uh, that speaks to uh, to their souls, right? Uh, and I have to I have to say that in these trips I've had even Muslim students, you know, joining us and feeling perfectly at home with all the students and also, you know, with uh, uh, I do not require the students, for example, to go to mass. But uh, uh, we had uh, last time in 2019, actually, Father Larisi, he celebrated, and Father Larisi is a professor now at he teaches Catholic studies, but he teaches also at the School of Theology. Uh, he celebrated Mass on the tomb of St. Peter's. And I tell students, you know, uh, if you would like to come, it's not a requirement because this is an academic course, right? Who wants to go to Mass? I'm going to wait for you at the hotel at 7 in the morning. And I'm going to wait until 7, 5, and then we are leaving, you know, for St. Peter's. Each and every of those students in line, we went to St. Peter's for, for Mass. And I always stood, you know, with students that uh, they didn't know much about Mass, that didn't know much about the Eucharist, etc., to explain to them what happens in, uh, uh, when we celebrate, you know, the Eucharist. Another, another little story that I have to share, when we were, when we were in Palermo, uh, the students had the chance to meet with the niece of Mother Teresa of Calcutta, we invited her, she lives in Palermo. I called her and I, I, I told her, you know, uh, I'm writing a book on Mother Teresa. It would be wonderful, you know, to, to get to know you. That's how uh, a step closer, you know, to, to, to meeting with Mother Teresa. She is the only uh, uh, living member of, of, of Mother Teresa's family. And she and her son actually came to dinner. Uh, with us in Palermo, and even this, this my students, you know, always uh, talk about this, uh, this, uh, this experience. So there are these all little, little stories uh, that uh, that we forge, you know, in in Italy that happen only in Italy, actually, not in any other country. Of course, obviously, I'm very biased about Italy, but uh, yeah. Dr. Masako, there is uh, two questions in the chat. Um, one from Heather Fault Cummins. Do you ever visit the Basilica of Santa Francesca Romana? No, we haven't visited this basilica now. No, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> I can speak about it. It's uh, right next to the forum. My my cousin's name. Uh, her name is Francesca Romana because her parents uh, have a story connected to the church. It's beautiful. It's next to the forum. So in your next trip. Uh, uh, Dr. Murzako, you have to put it uh, in, in, you know, in your list of things to do. Okay. <laughs> okay. Other other questions or? There is another question from Rosemary. She says, "I'm an alum and parent of a college age student. Do you take students from other colleges? Would you run an alumni trip?" Uh I would love to do that. Uh, I know that we have uh, uh, we have to make some uh, to discuss this with Dr. Pastorine, and I am looking forward actually to to talking to to her. I know that she has a lot of plans about uh, study abroad, so uh, I don't see any reason why not. Because even the students that were here presenting, they are all alum of Seton Hall. You know, they have graduated uh, City, uh, Seton Hall, but they are still very much connected. And the trip is one of those, uh, uh, you know, um, bonds of unity, you know, uh, that they have. I have to say, though, that sometimes, for example, uh, yeah, last year, I had a student that her dad happened to be in Rome on business. And that, the dad stayed with us for two days and he saw what we uh, what we did. And he's a business person actually in New Jersey. So um, so we have had parents and we've had some of our donors joining us in our trips. Uh, 
uh, alums. I would love to have you guys back, you know, and also to connect with other universities in uh, uh, because I don't I see you know a lot of benefits in this kind of uh, in this kind of connections and also uh, with this uh, uh, even exchange of, of experience. Okay, I always do my trips thematically, so I don't know how the others do them. Maybe semester in Rome, we can exchange experiences. So uh, yeah, I would be very open to this. Okay, other questions or comments for that matter? Well, Dr. Masako, I have a question. I know I've heard this from parents in mm -hmm. my discussions with them, you know, in regards to the pandemic and especially this being a part of our study abroad program, what do you see will happen? Of course, everything is so fluid in regards to the situation that everyone is dealing with. But what do you think will happen going forward with the study abroad program? Most likely something might not happen in the spring, but maybe in the summer. Uh, or what do you think is the future of what you're going to be um, providing in regards to this class and, and, and the study abroad program in, in relation to the Catholic Studies program? I mean, we were the first in our university to offer these experiences to students which have proven to be extremely successful. However, the study abroad is not going to, op uh, to happen during this uh, spring. I mean, we are not going to have even a spring break actually uh, next year. But it might be that we have a study abroad in uh, uh, during summer. Maybe if uh, you know we were allowed to have a study abroad. But uh, in the next years, of course, you know, we are going to fly and have this wonderful experiences to our students. And I know that we have had students, you know, coming to Seton Hall and making plans with my study abroad, you know, courses. For example, Jose uh, took two of my study abroad, actually three of my study abroad courses uh, in different countries. So uh, definitely, this is a tradition that we are going to, uh, to make it better and we will return to the study abroad, absolutely. Thank you. And Ines, if I can suggest, I mean, this is a wonderful time to plan. Um, we have a lot of time to design new programs, and I, I currently have a, actually a grant uh, under review, very small, uh, at Catholic de Lyon in France uh, with some colleagues, um, and we propose to create a digital exchange wow. first, so the students will get to work uh, with each other in digital projects and then I have an opportunity to do travel later. Um, I, I think it was last week or a couple of days ago we, we had an event from uh, with, the, with Gabriele Romani that was mm. uh, you know about the Michelangelo and the secret of the Sistine Chapel and we kind of had this uh, visual view or, and travel to the Sistine Chapel. Um, I think there is a lot that we can continue to do while we can travel physically. And I would like to use this time um, together to also plan what can we do so that we're, we're, we're ready as soon as we're able to travel uh, again. Absolutely. So, yeah. Right. right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we'll make the best out of, uh, you know, uh, working under the circumstances, the extraordinary circumstances that we are uh, in. And um, another thing, you know, besides visiting the North American college and staying with the seminarians and al also meeting the priests there and, um, uh, you know, a lot of connections between our priests and also the North American college, we also visit the Vatican radio. I worked for the Vatican Radio, so, you know, uh, uh, sent students there to visit uh, Pontifical Gregorian University, Pontifical Oriental Institute, Pontifical Biblical uh, Institute, so all these institutions that uh, uh, many, many people, you know, that are now at Seton Hall, uh, priests and lay people, we have finished our uh, degrees there, so there is a, uh, these connections are there, you know, in, uh, in Rome, very strong. So, uh, Sandro, any other questions or um, students, do you want to say anything else? It was very good to see everybody, you know, I miss you guys. I really, really 
did, you know, and it's so good to see you and also to see your how successful you have been, you know, after after season. But never forget of us, okay? Okay, guys. Uh-huh. Well, thank you, Dr. Musaku, for sharing your your time and your your talent and and your vision for this program and and inviting our your students to share their testimonials about this program and uh, we're we're so excited and as, as I said we recorded this session and we'll be able to share it with our greater scene hall community so I hope folks will view it and t and it'll touch them as it touched all of us that participated in this call um, yeah. and again you know this has been a, an effort amongst us all at, at scene hall to provide scene hall week with almost 38 virtual offerings and uh, and again, thank you, Dr. Musako. You've been so generous with your time. Every time I ask you to do something, you said yes. And uh, I really appreciate it. You're a, a treasure to this university. And again, thank you so much for your time. And thank you, Provost Passerini, for joining us as well. And everyone that's here, uh, please stay safe, stay healthy. Happy Halloween. Uh, stay away from the treats if you can. <laughs> but uh, thank you again for joining us and uh, have a great night. Arrivederci tutti. Buonasera. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, thank you. Thank you.